I'm really excited for Michael and Kirk that you could both join us today. Um, thank you. It's really, uh, really exciting and really an honor. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about my practice just briefly to contextualize why I'm working in this space and then I'll let Michael and Kirk introduce themselves. Um, but before I begin, I want to just take a second to acknowledge um, this sacred land um, as an important part of the practice of gardening, acknowledging the land itself as well as the original people of the land. So for those of us who are based in Boston um, or in Massachusetts, this land has been stewarded for millennia by the Massachusetts Wampanoag and Nipmuc people. Um, and I'm really grateful for the land and want to acknowledge um, the citizens of these nations and the work that they have put into the land now, in the past, and in the future. Um, and with that, I'll share a little bit more about my practice. Um, so I am, as Penny said, an interdisciplinary artist. And my work in um, the visual art world, as well as the social and public world, seeks to uh, interweave experiences of the internal and external landscapes to ameliorate the widening gulf between our bodies, the earth, and each other. Um, and my practice is centered on personal and collective narratives of vulnerability, focalizing the natural world as an extension of the body and as a locus for healing. Currently, I'm working on this series of drawings. Um, the title is a working title, um, but the pieces themselves are the scale of the body and a study of a dead tree leaning against a living tree in the forest. Um, I find these trees in these pairs. Um, sometimes it feels like the living tree is holding the dead tree and other times it looks like it is being suppressed by the dead tree. And um, for me, this is a really personal narrative. My mother died three years ago and through exploring this relationship between life and death and weight and bodies, um, I really view the tree as an extension of the body. Um, it allows me to examine my own experience with grief and to find healing through art making. I've extended this conversation about grief um, into larger, larger networks. Um, in 2017, my process project Acknowledgement Response worked as a social practice project through letter writing, drawing practices, and small individual curatorial practices to examine the ways that communities hold each other through grief and find collective healing through mutual support. Um, and my practice has also expanded into more kind of traditional public realm work. Um, I've created some sculptural work as well as have worked as an artist in residence um, at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I worked with pediatric and cancer center patients um, and created installations of patient work within the hospital, um, especially for patients who had long hospital stays to help aid in some of their um, emotional healing alongside their physical healing. Um, and the bottom piece here, the um, wings and feathers, was a piece created for a um, organization in Minneapolis that worked with um, victims of human sex trafficking um, on their uh, re-entry into the world um, and messages of hope and peace from others. Um, and so a little backstory on my work to hopefully give a tiny contextualization into the Co-Victory Gardens project. Um, I started Co-Victory Gardens in now uh, March of 2020 when COVID-19 and social distancing and um, concerns of isolation really kind of entered the vernacular and also an acknowledgement that we would all be spending a lot of time on screens um, and wanting to help people kind of engage with the physical world and find ways to seek connection in a physical world even when it feel, felt like that might not be possible. Um, 
So currently the Co Victory Gardens project has uh, taken off in North America. We have, uh, I believe, one Canadian participant, um, which is exciting. And um, the program of the Urbano project in incorporates a Co-Victory Gardens class, which if you want to participate, you can follow on Instagram down here at the bottom, um, at Co-Victory Gardens. Um, the class shares information about artists who are working in the space of gardening, social practice, and um, social justice. So, um, for instance, we've discussed Aqua Homes, whose project, the Roxbury Sunflower Project, is a Boston-based social practice gardening project working to develop community in Boston's historically Black neighborhood of Roxbury. Um, and Jordan Weber, who is the artist in residence at the Walker Arts Center, um, and developed um, a piece for, uh, for Minneapolis this year. And for you, if you want to join CoVictory Gardens, you can go to covictorygardens.com. Um, the participation in this project um, encourages you to do three things. One is to mark your garden either through um, signage or through coloring pages, or um, you can create stencils. Somehow create some signage uh, to indicate your participation and then to share your story about how gardening, especially during a pandemic, is impacting your life right now. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing and um, turn the mic over to Michael and to Kirk so they can explain their practices and more of why they're here. Um, and then from there, we'll have more of a conversation about kind of operating in this space of gardening during COVID. <laughs> Thanks Thank you for all of that, uh, <laughs> Sheila. Um, um, are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to start sharing our screen. Um, and um, once again, my name is um, Kirk Rea. I'm sitting here with Michael. Um, just this. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's quick. Yeah. Um, and we're sitting here in Portland, Oregon, and uh, in the Portland metro area, we want to recognize um, the indigenous folks of this land. Um, around us are the Multnomah, the Wasco, the Cowlitz, the Calf Calamit, the Clackamas, uh, Bands of Chinook, uh, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many tribes named and unnamed. Um, and indigenous communities that are active to this day. Um, and in this image, uh, this is the intertribal gathering garden um, here in Portland, Oregon, a native design, designed and led um, garden and gathering space. Yeah, I think give you arrow, yeah. Um, so just briefly, uh, my background is in uh, community-based art, fine art, and collective action and community support and engagement is uh, super important to my practice and in thriving as an individual. Um, so two past uh, groups that I was in that had a meaningful um, impact on my development as a community artist were being in a collective called Not Enough, which was a queer and trans um, art collective here in Portland, as well as um, Latino Art Now, uh, and both groups uh, creating space for our communities to, um, uh, to showcase our work. Um, and in the today, um, I work for, for a nonprofit called the City Repair Project. Um, and, uh, oops. What do you, oh, I'm trying to read. Read, yeah. Oh, no. There we go. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, read Sorry, it. tech just, issues. Just um, read it. So, City Repair, our mission is to foster thriving, equitable, and sustainable communities through justice, connection, and the creative reclamation of place. Um, normally, I have this memorized, but we just changed our mission statement. Um, so, still trying to um, imprint it in my brain. 
And uh, in doing work around place, placemaking, um, most folks in Portland, Oregon come to know us from seeing street paintings or um, murals directly on the road, which you see here. Um, so placemaking uh, is the heart of the conversation that uh, the nonprofit that I work for talks about. Um, and a sister organization called Project for Public Spaces they define placemaking as a reference to a collaborative process by which we can shape our public realm in order to maximize shared value. And please check out PPS. Uh, their website has a lot of great um, tools and um, guides, information on, on placemaking, like this um, graphic that has elements and principles of what makes a great place. And for city repair, um, we kind of simply think about placemaking as turning space, which is a zone void of meaning, into a place. So a zone now injected with community story. Um, a place is a space invested with meaning. And uh, in doing the, the types of placemaking projects that we typically do uh, here in the Portland metro area, um, there's three main ones. Uh, the first being uh, street paintings. Uh, which we saw them, uh, a few slides ago, as well as uh, them being painted uh, here. Uh, additionally, we do work with um, natural building. Um, sustainability is a strong or a core ethic of city repair. And with natural building, um, we're working with renewable materials, it's minimally processed, um, and in natural building, earthen building, the main type that we do here in Portland is working with cob, which is a mixture of uh, straw, clay, sand, and water, which is an English version of, um, of earthen building. We do benches, uh, sculptures, tiny homes, uh, many, many things. Um, and then lastly, uh, we do ecological landscaping. Um, and this is on a range of working in parking strips or hell strips, uh, putting in pollinator habitat to helping community members like take out their lawn to put in um, food gardens or medicine gardens, to working in what we traditionally might think of as a community garden, uh, food forests, uh, urban farms, so quite a, quite a scale. Uh, drawing, and for us, we draw upon permaculture or traditional ecological knowledge um, earth care is very important, so supporting um, habitat, thinking about the land beyond human use. And, but then with human use, having a diversity of applications like food, medicine, craft. Um, and uh, City Repair has been around since 1996, and gosh, we've done hundreds of projects at this point, supporting about 40 communities uh, per year. Uh, and in, in doing this community work, um, while the, there's these visible outcomes, like the, the murals, the buildings, um, gardens, like this medicine garden, um, the, the physical uh, development is less important. It's like, it's awesome, but it's secondary. For us, our primary objective is relationship building, and doing these projects are excuses for us to come together, to gather, and to get to know one another. Um, and with that, in this work, um, I've been able to work a lot with uh, my dear friend Michael, current roommate, um, and he will tell his story. Yeah, and it is, um, is, is always fascinating, these presentary moments, um, even people you know or work with, hearing them formalize language around their own work. So we'll try to ping some of the things that um, Kirk mentioned. And yeah, as mentioned, um, Kirk and I are roommates. Um, we kind of got um, sucked into quarantine together. Um, and during that arc of time, um, which I guess I was super segued or immediately jumped in. I'm uh, aspiring master artist Michael Bernard Stevenson Jr. 
and um, essentially Kirk and I or kind of the Prosperity Garden Project or City Repair or the things that you have heard about us so far um, began when we were quarantined together um, and um, City Repair normally does an event called the Village Building Convergence um, every summer where it's a week long of programming, cob building, um, garden making, convening socially. And um, we kind of immediately responded to the fact that the physical in-person component would be missing and how could we kind of create and provide that online. I also realized that like I created my slideshow totally oriented around this project and less even about just my practice, but I think it's gonna work. Um, so this was the uh, Village Building Convergence um, brand art this year. And it was also interesting because it was in its 20th year. Um, and something I did not include uh, in the slideshow, but one of the other events that we did kind of co-writing the Prosperity Garden Network intention was a time capsule project um, in the inaugural year of the village building convergence. They like made, or actually, well, whatever, I don't need to over contextualize, but they essentially were making a cob structure. And then during the making of this kind of scribbled things on paper and like buried a time capsule in the cob structure. And so independent of an awareness of that, we were like, oh, like what if we did a time capsule project? And then we learned that there was a time capsule and then we like unearthed it um, and are still kind of reflecting on producing new content to be reinserted in where we unearthed the former. Um, and so kind of just helps you cultivate an awareness. And I, I also realized that part of this presentation is to kind of further everyone who's here's awareness of what socially engaged art is. And so as we were trying to throw projects at this organization, as Kirk mentioned, like he's working with City Repair and I was an artist in residence for artists in residence and community organizer for the village building convergence and so one of the pitches was to like reproduce this time capsule thing um anyway essentially i i have i wish my and maybe maybe it's happening maybe this is it i wish my work fit more easily into this kind of organizational structure or ability to explain or understand but i did split my work into different categories to create both to a, a program where I presented parts of my work and um, invited other artists and local community organizers very much like this event to present about their work on a common theme. And so one of those uh, events and common themes of my own work was building community with and for young people. Uh, a lot of my practice is in direct collaborations with young people um, in order to both kind of like empower their thought processes and through that develop their kind of imaginative capacity through the making of that work and presenting of that work to a wider audience, um, the, like building their kind of confidence and skill in whatever kind of activity we're working on. And um, so that is like my work, my artist practice. And it, in this image, we happen to make masks, but it, in every instance, we're kind of doing a different thing. And for me, kind of the mediums, intentions or materials are the people I'm working with in their experiences and is less like paint or cardboard or those things are interchangeable and the kind of important factor and the thing that I'm kind of leveraging is the specific inv individuals I'm working with and in this instance or in this topic, young people specifically, people who are normally not given kind of power and agency on the platform that I am as an artist and I kind of share that power and agency with them and present it at a scale that they are not normally given access to. Um, a lot of my work and a lot of kind of the origins of my work, which is kind of some of the kind of overlapping interest in what we're all here to talk about, is building community around gathering around food. Um, and uh, this is a shot from a, my first of so far three to four iterations of uh, belated birthday party. So this is my first belated birthday party um, of which I invited friends to gather on my belated birthday which if you're tracking is every day except my birthday. Um, and usually so far has been a short proximity from the origins of my birthday. And um, this, uh, in this, uh, I'm making a familial meal, which I will talk more about later, but essentially use recipes and specific meals and specific 
instances or occasions for gathering and kind of provide some additional kind of formal components, right? Like I'm sure everyone listening has had a birthday before. I'm sure people have celebrated different holidays that have a common theme or meal. And I, I leverage around those things or create my own versions of those. Um, and that again is the project, right? Like this image you might, if you're trying to correlate what social practice is as an art practice, you might say that this is the final painting, right? This event occurred, the food was consumed, dialogue was had, and the only thing that remains is, is images from the event. And so those images represent the work on into the future um, and as a ways that socially engaged projects continue to exist is a documentation of the things that happened. Um, and I also presented about um, a project I'm doing called the Afro Contemporary Art Class. We framed that and other happenings as building communities through cultural organizing, which is important generally, has become kind of more important in my practice in the past year, and is now, ironically, I have been kind of charging forward in this pretty specific intention at a time that building communities through cultural organizing has never been or is, is reaching a pinnacle of importance in the kind of arc of human history. Um, and so these were the themes that I organized events around, but all of them were kind of umbrellaed, like kind of in the VBC 2020 kind of umbrella was um, around a project called Won't You Be My Neighbor, uh, which was specifically um, me collaborating with a bunch of people to um, present an art show, but um, was, and I, again, I forget, what was the last thing you said? Convening people, social network? Uh, well, focusing on relationship building. Focusing on relationship building. So this project is in essence that, um, um, and this is, so again, kind of commingling the garden food mood. This is a, a shirt, the Alfred, um, what does it say? Alfred Farmer's Market. I was the first market manager of the inaugural Alfred Farmer's Market. It's now in its like, I don't know, eighth or 10th year. Um, I built a lot of community in the town of Alfred. This is us kind of doing a little rip on the, on this is me holding the, um, the hour kind of redux of the local newspaper. So I'm going to like very quickly breeze through this and some other projects, but I used food as a tool to gather people around the the premise of of recruiting them to be a part of this project uh and so i had an event called the gathering of artists where i invited artists to come and um learn about the project i also held an event where locals who were some of which i believe were the oldest was in their 70s or so um kind of also were invited to the project and uh that event i was in collabor i was collaborating with a bunch of local farms uh these were greens and beets from a local farm uh and then also some uh grass-fed beef from another local farm and some local uh goat milk ice cream so a lot of the work i do especially oriented around food is thinking a lot about where that food was grown who grew it and like what are kind of the again as i was saying that people are inter interchangeable with medium in this instance, food was the medium. Where did it come from? What's its history? How has it grown? All of those things become important nuances about the work. Uh, and then I was visioning this cool moment where everyone was like shaking hands together. Also, I guess for relevance, I coordinated this whole project remotely. Um, so very much again, kind of like we are interacting was the way that I was interacting with this primary community and it was being kind of co-facilitated by people who were on the ground. And so they arranged this little like photo shoot. Um, and so here's all the people shaking hands, the artists shaking hands with the residents, kind of, again, as I was saying before, this documented event becomes a part of the medium or the thing that's presented, the history of the project that as much as the project is rooted in the relationships that took place during the arc of the event happening, it is kind of just these images that last and are, exist in a way for me to communicate to you what the work was and how it happened and what it looked like and felt like. And this is, uh, I'm on this little laptop screen, um, uh, sitting on someone's head. I was attending that event remotely. Um, and so again, just thinking about mediums, I think a lot about my own cultural history, where I come from, uh, what's missing from that, uh, what can I kind of like build in. Um, food, again, remains really important to that. I have these tattoos on my inner forearms. I call them my coat of arms on my arms. 
um, depicting certain familial meals that were common and like historically relevant in my life practice. And so I've reproduced these things. This tattoo has a documentary about it where I've reproduced the meal. This is actually the first time I've reproduced it incomplete and depicted it next to itself. Um, but this is my grandmother, me showing her the commemorative tattoo that I made for her. Um, and I was making this meal, again, kind of like investing and in learning, drawing my family roots, et cetera. Um, I've also used that same meal to teach to young people who then have like presented that food to their own communities. Uh, again, just pinging the Afro-contemporary art class. Um, we were studying the various Afro-contemporary artists, including Emery Douglas, who was the art director for the Black Panther. Um, and so we were doing a lot of reenacting of kind of Black Panther imagery. And one of the things we did really intently was we reproduced the Black Panther breakfast program at their own school. And so again, thinking about the materials, so yes, food, history of food, context of food, the individual youth interests, all of these things were important nuances of making the project. And I shot all of these um, using a, a 35 millimeter film camera. So they're all kind of documented in the way that they were documented originally. Um, and um, also thinking about nutrition and getting nutrition into school and all of these underlying premises that can exist when we're talking about the project later. Um, and this is kind of my last salvo, but one of the things we did was um, reenact historic photos. So this is Kent Ford, who's a local Black Panther. Um, again, like an important historical component to the work that we were doing in the present. And so this is Kent Ford as a, an older man uh, at the reenactment breakfast. Um, and then we have these random kind of photos from elsewhere in the country of the Black Panther breakfast program. And then we're trying to find moments that were similar to document. Um, this one was documented twice. Um, and then right now we're in the process of producing a publication for the book or for all of the work that we did over the past year. And in that young people are kind of also writing about their own experience doing this. So this is Azariah um, talking about why he chose the photo and um, what he felt reenacting it. Um, and so I have many, many of these projects. I've done a project, Tables for Two. Um, again, thinking about where the food came from, what does it look like, who's the audience, all of these different criteria about what I'm doing and why. Um, so I'm just breezing through these. Could talk endlessly about each of these projects, but just helping the audience see what the aesthetic is. It's never the same, and it is always in direct correlation to who I'm working with and what's happening. And then the documentation is kind of a pivot point to represent it and share that and help other people understand both what happened and what kind of comments, like a painting is ageless. You continue to look at it and think about it um, and draw kind of contemporary premises into it. Um, so that exists here in this kind of documentation as well. Um, so that's me and my practice and kind of some of the root elements that put me in a place to be thinking about um, the Prosperity Garden Network as a project. So hopefully that is helpful to understanding all the things. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you, for, for sharing your work and your practices. Um, I also really appreciate, Kirk, that you called out the uh, Project for Public Spaces um, a group that I follow a lot, working in the public realm in my day job, um, being a public art administrator. Um, their work is incredible. And I, um, I would love now to just kind of dialogue more openly about the, the relationship between the Prosperity Garden Network and Faux Victory Gardens. Both projects started in response to COVID-19 with the intention of building community and supporting um, social practice, public art practice projects. Um, and I imagine also given that the village, village building convergence is part of city repair, um, for y'all it had a, a placemaking element as well. Is that a correct assumption? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, tell me more about how you got from kind of the idea to the kind of actual um, manifestation of the project and and how you got to um, kind of the methods of participation for um, for community members yeah so I would say that for phase one of the prosperity garden network 
um, it started right away after the shelter in place uh, happened here in Portland um, in being home a lot. Um, like part of my own like individual cell was to, to garden. And um, so I was doing a lot of land tending and realizing that, you know, folks needed plants. Like we were hearing about stores running out um, both plants and seeds because it was, they're in high demand um, with everyone sheltering in place. And um, so we started putting up plants and also knowing that uh, our normal programs had to be postponed. We normally work with 40 or so placemaking uh, sites in that we had to pivot away from that. So we were realizing that giving away plants, um, some that we had already developed or um, propagated to be able to do our regular work um, could be given away um, to serve folks in the new times that we're in. Um, so we, ha we had some plants, we started potting up plants. Um, uh, and in like the first month and a half of shelter in place, we gave away about 600 plants to about 60 households, um, focusing on um, outreach into networks of uh, black, indigenous people of color communities, as well as uh, queer and trans. Um, folk. And then we started to realize that, um, and, and Michael and I chatting in our, like getting coffee, like good morning, um, chatting about the world, um, Michael's art practice, we realized that we could then take this idea of um, giving away plants and as well as receiving resources and turn that into a more formal mutual aid project um, and incorporate it into um, Michael will both Michael as well as uh, other uh, artists in um, his art and social practice program. Yeah, and is interesting some kind of um, I, I don't I don't know if we talked about this before is obviously relevant to tell to or say to the audience, but I I know you're also kind of contextualizing the COVID victory garden so. Um, some of our initial inspirations and one of my like one of something I was really excited about for many years earlier in my practice and I guess I should say like when I was the Alfred Farmers Market manager I was like doing this work in a way but I didn't have language or understanding of like what I was doing or what I like knew like where I, my entry point was but I didn't know like how to kind of represent it or things like that and an early inspiring project was the I think it's just called Victory Gardens. Uh, it may have some butchering language, but was done by, I mean, so there was, there is Victory Gardens, the historic event, and then a group of artists called the Future Farmers reproduced that project in San Francisco. And so I was really inspired, again, as I've mentioned in my own practice of like researching some parts of history and kind of like reenacting that history in the present and drawing out certain historical components of that context and then kind of intercommingling that with contemporary contexts. So that was an inspiring component. And one of the reasons actually why we didn't keep Victory Gardens in the name was when we were talking about the project and kind of pitched it to the board, they had expressed, or the Board of City Repair, that they weren't super excited about Victory Gardens being closely linked to a war effort. And we're like, okay, well, we can just shift the name to a different thing. And if anything, kind of further not only remove it from its kind of problematic historical contexts, but also kind of like nuance the intentions of it in its kind of contemporary form. Um, so for all of those reasons, it's like how and why it took place. And we were also kind of inspired by, again, just my own practice, but art as an approach, like this could in some way just be a gardening project. We're like, oh, we're permaculturists. We do gardening, yeah. like it could be that but we are kind of trying to also leverage the intentions and intentionality within an art practice to say like, okay, here are some things that we're really interested in doing. Here are some of the things we're interested in interrogating past and present. And how can we both like use that and frame that? And so other kind of projects we were inspired by was Joseph Boys did a basalt rock project where there was all of these rocks kind of like dumped in front of a museum. And it was like, he'll only remove a rock the giant huge rocks when uh, I think an oak tree was planted somewhere. And so by this intentional act as an artist got a, like dispersed many, many trees, 
um, over 100, I believe. And uh, also Agnes Danes did a wheat field project. Um, and one of the kind of poetic images of that is the wheat field with the Trade Center in the background. So thinking about location and juxtaposition and context and industry and all of these things, when you're a gardener, you're like, yes, plants are cool. And we, and in collaboration with City Repair, the yes, plants are cool part is like so also there. But by intercommingling with art intentions, we're able to draw forward all of these kind of excitements and concerns that have conceptual or um, cultural values. And as it relates specifically to COVID-19 and locking down is food security. And as everyone is maybe experiencing wherever they are in the world, kind of like a not overly exciting way of the government handling your kind of local affairs and a need to own that and to manage it yourself. Um, and so all of those things are in this kind of soup of ideas of what brought um, Prosperity Gardens to life. Yeah. I'd love to respond to a couple of things. First of all, with our youth artists, um, I think like week one or week two, um, the Ignis Dennis Wheatfield was a piece we, we talked about. Um, and we all, this past week, talked about future farmers um, and, and their Victory Gardens project. So um, I appreciate that kind of mutual um, art historical lens by which to um, explore ideas about what art is and what art can be. And um, I think especially in a time where um, at least, you know, um, the majority of kind of the impulse of understanding the art world is very institutionalized. And when institutions are shut down and you can't go view art in a personal formal setting, um, how can we really bring art into people's homes and lives and experiences? Um, and validate those experiences as art experiences is something that I have been thinking about. Um, and so like for me, another kind of conceptual pull of Co-Victory Gardens was not only um, exploring how the, the actions that everyone is taking um, in their personal private settings are art actions um, and naming them as such, um, but also um, illustrating how um collective action even if in private spaces has collective impact um and so uh the kind of metaphor that i think i, sh I have shared before is um is like when uh, folks don masks and sanitize hands and and follow public health protocol we understand that those small individual actions have public impact um but that um, how can we expand that conceptually to see how our individual actions in our gardens have, um, have public impact and um, really pushing the notion of how we experience place and space in our gardens um, as being kind of a collective opening um, in a time where I feel like a lot of people um, due to the pressures of the world right now um, might feel a desire to kind of um, close down somewhat. Um, Penny just pointed out that we are at quarter two, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> time flies. So for our last 15 minutes, um, we're going to make some time for Q&A. But first, um, the Prosperity Garden Network, you two will share uh, how folks can participate in your project. Um, I already shared how people can participate in Co-Victory Gardens. Um, and would love to, to highlight your project and participation now. Cool. And yeah, we're gonna, what we're, how we're gonna do that is pulling up our website, which will be helpful and we're gonna walk through it. Although I also wanted to call out, I was very interesting and, and maybe obvious, but when you were actually presenting COVID-3 gardens and you're like showing images, I was like, oh, funny, this is, it's clearly not the same project in the fact that they're named to different things, but they are certainly like invested in very similar outcomes and so um maybe after we'll have a better um opportunity to talk about how like we really weave those things together uh yeah. but we definitely encourage folks to uh, um find their way to either or both um and maybe it's just an idea of connecting the maps i'm trying to find the window although maybe just pressing this bing bang boom Sharing the screen. That's what I was really. Oh, 
we're just going to pull up the website and um, So our um, website is villagebuildingconvergence.com. And when you find your way there, um, on the menu, there's placemaking at a distance. And the first page to look at is the Prosperity Gar Garden Network. And this page gives uh, a bit more of the history, pretty much everything we just chatted about. Um, it, gives the guidelines of being involved, which our guidelines are you have to draw a picture or map of your garden, include measurements, um, and you have to have some sort of like exchange, like social or community exchange component, whether you're giving plants away or asking for help for your garden. So you can be receiving or giving or both. And then there is a form uh, to fill out that gives us that information and uh, we also have some in-house resources, so this is for us to be able to offer resources or to receive resources. Um, and for folks not in the Portland area, maybe we'll mail you some uh, mustard green seeds. And there's also an opportunity for you to see other, get other people to, in your community to participate in something as a group and to um, kind of build networks, nodes of the network within your own kind of community which as that's loading um, was really interesting just the other day, Jordan, who's a collaborator on this project and the time capsule project, um, Kirk and we were having a meeting and Kirk was like sharing a recipe for a, a weed tea by taking different weeds and just letting them soak in the water and watering your plants as a nutrient. And so one of the other premises is just the sharing of knowledge is one of the things we wanted to open up by having the network is like people being isolated in their own spaces. This is an opportunity and way for us to kind of share knowledge about the practice of growing plants. So. Yeah, so um, our second page is uh, shows documentation and um, we're also trying to represent uh, showing collective action. So these are um, folks in the Prosperity Garden Network. Then this is a representation of the square footage uh, combined because we're all in our own spaces, but we want to show collective impact. Um, and to that also, um, again, thinking of like permanence or documentation or how's the project seen or viewed or experienced is like the drawing um, and having a gallery of drawings was the way for us to kind of retain this event that is, I guess, temporal in a way um, and to kind of visualize it. Um, and we're excited about the variety of different ways that people are representing that. Yeah. And then we've got an Instagram paging, page for um, documentation as well. So villagebuildingconvergence.com, placemaking at a distance, and that will get you to where... You're gonna skip that thing? Which one? The map thing. Oh, well, well we, we were, while Michael was talking, there was also a map showing the location. So we've got the square footage map, but then we have a map showing within Portland. And actually, it, it, if you zoom out, it does have the world. So if you are, like we have someone in Dallas, um, for folks on the East Coast, you can sign up and that will be represented locationally on that map. Awesome. Great. Great. Sharing. Yeah. Penny, what's our Q&A like? Well, first, I want to give a round of applause to our panelists for everything they've shared so far. Yeah. Thank you. And now let's hear some more. We have some great questions coming in and uh, drop our question in the chat or the Q&A if you think of something while we're hearing the responses. Um, the first one comes from one of our youth artists, Axel. Thanks so much for this great question. Um, while some of these projects were started uh, maybe as a response to the quarantine, how do you see your projects moving forward past quarantine? Yeah, it's funny. I happened to see that question at some point while I was like, and I, I am excited by it. It's a really interesting question. And was like, we, so we had this really interesting deadline for the village building convergence. And like, I was coordinating four presentations with guests at each. And so it was, it was a heavy lift. Um, and kind of nurturing and trying to develop this project. And part of what I was saying is like the goal is that this project can we could set the foundation for it and maybe this is just the first year of it happening um because this premise is not less significant at any time and 
if anything, to like think about the gap in time between now and Victory Gardens as a premise, um, the original, um, is like, and there is this lack of food security in the Americas and the world um, that could be addressed. And I think we're experiencing that with a lot of different things right now, a lot of different kind of like social or political spheres. I mean, that was to, to kind of contextualize this in a different way is, is for those of you who don't know the Black Panthers, when they started the, the free breakfast program, that was because there wasn't any. And so they, the Black Panthers are responsible for various forms of, of mutual aid of which the government co-opted um, and exist in some kind of less optimal form. But could, at any time, citizens could organize to enhance or replace these different systems. And so when I was designing this project in collaboration with everyone, I continued to say that like, the hope is really that we get done what we can. And I think even as we all adjust in this strange changing world, we actually haven't done all that is literally possible. We've talked about more as being possible than has been completed. But I, I continue to echo that as, and is like a reason for doing projects both that are iterative and or are closely linked with a My goal is that both can you collaboration with city repair, but just even like if I move from Portland or whatever, the project is so well established that city repair continues to be a proprietor and holder of space for the Prosperity Garden Network. And that also like Victory Gardens becomes decentralized where it actually doesn't need a centralizing agent that people could just organize themselves um, and is hopefully kind of a takeaway because the project is really just framing something that people are already doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so people could be doing that and can self-organize and kind of need catalyzation for that, but can be the sustaining force uh, ongoing. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. It's great. Yeah, I think for, yeah, for Go Victory Gardens, there's definitely a relationship for me to the pandemic. A lot of the stories that I'm trying to capture right now are like how gardening impacts our bodies and our spirits and our experiences of the world amidst the pandemic. And there's this kind of parallel conversation around healing and and gardening as maybe an act of self-care. And, um, and so for me, Axel, I think my project um, is a little bit specific to the pandemic, but again, I'm not defining how people garden in the long term. My hope would be that um, as a way to kind of um, encourage people to invest in their own green spaces and support gardening as a, as a way of um, existing in a durational creative outlet. Um, I, I hope it has ongoing implications. Great, thank you so much. Um, oh, I have one more question I want to make sure we get to that came in. Um, what are the obstacles, if there are, that you face during these projects? And I think this came in, Michael, when you were kind of largely talking about social practice or projects in general. So kind of what obstacles you run into um, doing this? Um, this project specifically or social project, pro practice projects at large? Um, let's maybe just keep it at this project specifically. Um, but if you want to mention something on a large, uh, for some of our students, it's like their first exposure to these sure. type of projects. So that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I would say volunteerism can be one obstacle because, you know, we might step in with a lot of passion um, to support. Um, but we're like volunteers can only last so long um, and that can, um, yeah, just change the dynamics over time. Like we were working with many uh, student interns during the autumn and had support for some of the organizing we were doing. And then their time came to an end, you know, with the, the end of the term. So then we're kind of in a different phase as we restructure um, how, how much capacity we have to do this work. Yeah, and capacity, even as organizers, I mean, this project is not, I mean, interesting because like kind of the question things that, but like, nothing none of the, this project isn't kind of funded and kind of its origin was funded by paying me to do a presentation for the village building convergence and i kind of like 
quadrupled what was like expected or is kind of the direct monetary link. Um, and so capacity even for ourselves, but it's interesting also just like the disembodiedness of it. Like it's really easy for someone to be like, that's a cool project and to sit on their couch. Um, there's a lot less kind of like media buy-in whereas like for the Afro-Contemporary Art class, like people were in the room. Um, and so it was like, cool, we're gonna do this now. And so it's like easier that way. Um, that being said, again, pinging Won't You Be My Neighbor, which I'm actually doing an iteration of that in Bria, Kentucky right now, remotely, of which Bell Hooks is probably gonna participate in, which is super epic and exciting. Um, so things can happen. It just is like, how well can you package it and get people like interested and excited about it at a different distance. I think, and maybe is implicit in the conversation, more generally something that occurs with social practice projects is it really calls into play ethics. Um, and if this hasn't come up already is like something we debate a lot in the social practice program and is like a challenging conversation always because everyone kind of comes to the table with their own kind of ethical palette. Um, and unlike painting where you're like, oh, I don't use these kind of paints because they have heavy metals, is like there's a reason to do and to not do things that involve other people that is not always considered that well. And even when considered, if you're approaching it from a certain lens, it's really easy to like ignore or neglect other lenses that are important. Um, and so that I could talk about that forever and have many, many anecdotal instances of that, um, but is like a majorly important layer that is, is challenging in a lot of different ways. Awesome, maybe I'll jump in and ask one more of the questions we got and point it to Sheila for a first answer, first pass. Um, how do you balance food for insects and wildlife and food for people? Or I might say, yeah, understand the balance or incorporate it into your work. Yeah, um, I personally, my approach for Co-Victory Gardens has been to um, be very open about um, the fact that different people have different capacities for different kinds of gardening um, and different interests and different physical spaces. Not everyone has uh, an open green space um, as part of the space where they live. And so if you happen to have a plant or you're supporting someone else's um garden and you want to claim your work as part of co-victory gardening um i think that is wonderful and if you have um plants that support pollinators and not people um that is also something that i welcome into the co-victory garden project i think um for me um a lot of the history of victory gardens has been about producing food um and so the co-victory gardens is about cultivating community and that being the, the thing that we're really growing together is a relationship to each other um, as the primary product or, um, you know, the produce is, is in the people. So the, the you know, a uh, creature that can consume whatever you grow is um, something that I, I am, um, not partial to personally. That's great. And we had another question just about the funding sources uh, that you get. I, Michael briefly touched on that, um, but uh, just thinking on how to fund projects that, um, you know, might have been physical and public prior to COVID-19. Um, as artists, are you paying yourselves, receiving honorariums for other sources? Um, so yeah, any quick words on that? And then, then I think we might call it. Cool. Yeah. Um, I was typing a response, so I just typed it and it disappeared. So who knows what that did, but I will kind of ping that. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's somewhere, maybe it's answered. If you have a Q and A oh, area yeah. and you go to answered that you could find that there if you're like needing specific nuance, but yeah, I, uh, my whole is like, I applied for a job that I didn't get, which is like sad, but um i'm now now that i've graduated and i'm off federal loans it's like actually my kind of whole life or whatever it's it's un disconcerting but it's like a an instability that has existed for many years of my life um that being said um 
there are many avenues of which I kind of outlined there. Um, institutional affiliation. So me being affiliated with the Village Building Convergence, I did get an honorarium for doing that. I am, we are, we are receiving honorariums for participating in projects like this. And it's interesting specifically with social practice. Sometimes you do a project because you're passionate about it and it's just intercommingled in your life. But then you, I, you know, I, I end up getting brought on to present my work. And so I'm being paid to present my work, but the project itself was unfunded. Um, but some of the examples I say is like, yeah, institutional affiliation. Sometimes there's money that is trying to, it's like, oh, we, we need money to give, you know, folks who are in, uh, in aging home activities. And you're like, okay, well, I'm going to build a project around meeting that need. And then the funding is going to be supporting that project. Um, but also have on more than one occasions found folks who have some money. I mean, so there's the crowdfunding option. But also, you know, the Won't You Be My Neighbor project was actually funded by a friend of mine who, who supported the project in the amount of $2,000. So the art institution had some funds and greased the wheels for doing all the other things. And this wealthy benefactor donated money to the gallery that paid me directly. Um, and that was all kind of a handshake agreement behind the scenes but essentially was someone who's passionate about supporting not only my work, but that specific project and was able to kind of make it happen by finding someone who was excited enough about it and had enough money to, to afford it. And, you know, to me, $2,000 is a lot of money and very helpful, but to that person, it was money that they had to contribute to enacting that idea. And so those, that is in, in this odd economy, actually a lot of people are actually being called to service in that way right now um, and I'm developing a project that's almost specifically designed around real allocation of wealth actually more than one project um, and so that is very possible and I think if, if there's anything to actually say about that is you know I didn't talk a lot about process like oh first you make a spreadsheet or whatever <laughs> you know it was like oh there would be these people we talked about these things and it's like that's how I talk about my work to yeah. people who are a part of the project or to people who have money. I'm just like, this is what's happening. This is what we're interested in. These are the things we kind of do. Like, do you have enough money for that? Um, and so anyone who's interested in doing projects like this, um, it is just having really frank conversations about what you're interested in and what you're trying to get to happen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that's always a question. So that is really helpful to hear your answer. Um, should we all throw um, some links into the into the chat box so people can find um, our information later? And I know, like Michael, you have tons of internet content about all the projects you're doing. Um, so I don't know if you can throw those in easily. Um, I can as well, um, so people can can find more and learn more about what you're doing. And I put yeah, the gonna, go ahead. yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, I put the link to Urbano Projects, um, the Co-Victory Gardens page, so that goes through to all of Sheila's social media, she mentioned. Um, I really love the idea of, like, yeah, the documentation piece was super interesting, and um, you can thread to that with the Co-Victory Gardens and the Urbano link, and also see what other things we're working on. Um, but yeah, to share, and um, I'm going to do one more round of applause for our panelists, Michael, Kirk, and Sheila. Thank you so much. I want to thank you for participating in this and apologize for coming so late. I've been through a very stressful and channeling, challenging day, but I am so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, it's great. And also just want to highlight in the chat, um, Equa, whose who's art was one of the slides that I shared. Um, through the website for her project in the in the chat. So check that out for another Boston-based social practice gardening project, um, which I love. And I noticed we were muted. I don't know if anyone heard, but I was thanking you for inviting us. Um, and uh, yeah, we really appreciate the support and the interest um, and all the attendees. Um, and for those of you who are, have a genuine curiosity, it is these small networks these little rooms where you're talking about your work. I mean, Sheila ended up meeting us through seeing our work being presented at the Village Building Convergence. Um, so small networks make large networks. Um, and so, yeah, definitely encourage folks to do that, but appreciate being invited into the small network here. So thank you. Awesome.
Well, I'm really glad you, you had time today. And I, I really am excited to see um, the ways that our projects overlap and maybe have parallel futures. Um, prior to this uh, program starting, Michael is sharing that uh, he's planning a dispersed picnic, um, which uh, the youth artists at Urbana will be planning our own kind of celebration in September as well. Um, that might look like a dispersed picnic, depending on what route we go. Um, so, so we might have parallel practices coming um, down the road even more, which is exciting. Yeah, parallel practices. <laughs> That's an art center if I ever heard of. Um, yeah, and just to even for if you all end up doing that, one of the formats or the kind of rough format is that the event will be happening at a park. One of the things we're doing is it's in coordination with a large organization in town, but I, I had a meeting this morning and I was like, wow, I'm feeling over capacity. Let's do the easy version. Um, and so we're spending a lot of the budget just on food and like telling people to like bring their own blankets and we will give them food from a black business. And that was what I was referencing with the reallocation of wealth. And even what I said to the organization, they're like, oh, what if we like spend some money and print blankets? and I was like, this is cool and poetic, but is also more work. And like, really we're in a time of just getting dollars in pockets. Um, and so there's that component of it. Um, a large umbrella for my food-based work is called Grandmother's Kitchen. Grandmother apostrophe, S in parentheses, apostrophe S, both of my grandmothers, double grandmothers. Um, and um, so it'll be grandmother's kitchen presents um the bring your own blanket something something add more words um but everyone will be kind of prompted to show up at the same place bring their own blankets we'll be very careful about distancing between blankets as a way to maintain social distancing safety protocols um but one of the other kind of features of the event will be meeting meeting strangers and having discourse about some of the kind of political unrest that's happening right now mm. and so we'll be kind of prompting that dialogue into the space which i think will have and quite naturally, um, but I'm also entertaining developing a bunch of pamphlets that reflect on some of the educating that needs to be happening right now and distributing those pamphlets at the event and kind of recruiting folks, including a youth-based kind of activist organization called Fridays for Freedom to like insert themselves in the space and to talk about their own experiences. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really great place for dialogue, if not just gathering. Um, and so that project will be pinging both things. Oh, man. So exciting. Um, obviously, I think we could talk for a long time, um, but we are 10 over. Um, we'll, we'll bid if you, if you want to turn on your screen and say hi or anything. Um, uh, I'm personally feeling pretty casual. <laughs> um, would love to see your faces and, um, and hear any more questions, but can kind of do a casual, a casual trickle out here. Wonderful to meet you both, and thank yeah. you all for being here tonight. Thanks, Thanks again for having us. Thanks for introducing it. Yeah, we're excited to see more about how this project develops for everyone in the larger programming. Um, so yeah, thanks for helping us help you kick it off or something. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Take Seriously, care. thank you. Hmm. Mm. It's like folks are doing a proper trickle out. Yeah, <laughs> um, no. If anyone has final questions, yeah, feel free this to. This is the thing that I, I dislike about kind of the Zoom world is like after an event in an art space, I, oh, oh, hi. <laughs> in the real world, we would like trickle out and ask each other questions kind of more, sure. um, more casually. So we can try to enact that now. <laughs> yeah, you're out. welcome. And if you're looking, as our event will be happening in early September. So if somehow super acute, being like, how did it go? Will is helpful. Let us know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, are excited. I, as I mentioned before, I'm interested in doing iterative things, and so, and was a lot of my social practice began around food, and then kind of has leaned on it but it hasn't centered it um but we'll be kind of returning to that in the freedom from grad school um 
but I'm interested in iterative projects and am excited both to do more food projects, to theoretically do another picnic project, and to maybe even kind of continue branding, bring your own blanket events. Um, yeah, so. yeah, I like to bring your own blanket um, and, and create your own picnic space. Um, but I, I really appreciate the added layer of um, encouraging conversations um, around kind of the issues of our, our time. Um, have you thought about like how to encourage people to approach people they don't know? Because I feel like right now the challenge with COVID is like you go for a walk and you see people and you like, diverge right yeah, but, like i want to get as far away from you as possible um which is like just so hard to overcome when you're trying to actually create connection yeah um it is interesting because the dialogue is like at an early stage um you know i've had a few meetings about it and it is interesting because i'm collaborating with a larger art institution so they have like there's certain metrics or concerns yeah. Um, that being said, like, you know, I think we're well navigating them, uh, or, you know, feel exciting in ways. Also some of the solutions we've come up with, but certain things remain unanswered. That being said, I'm excited because like, there's a lot of organizing happening here where whatever large scale events with people at them, um, mostly like activist leaning. Um, but some, a frustrating component about it is like, there seems to be this like broad spectrum neglect of like distancing, which yeah. it's clearly not immediately dangerous, but seems like slightly neglectful of some of the things that's even being organized around. Um, and so in this kind of more social structure and less kind of activist oriented structure, we can really, at least, and I'm like the, the conductor of ceremonies or whatever. So am going to include quite, strict encouragements around distancing including probably creating some form of measuring tool to like measure between blanket spaces um but will it create this like weird interesting collaboration where people are like oh is my blanket closer to your blanket so we'll kind of create this form of kind of informal like interaction um but in this kind of structuring and safety will again kind of when people show up We'll have this moment where it's like hey thanks for showing up like here's how you plug in and it kind of through that we'll also say like it's really important that you also get to know people that you don't already know yeah. um so there will be that and i don't know what you have if you've done any kind of like picnicky things but i've had a couple of like going out of towns and like whatever engagement party people excited birthdays and so people show up to the park and like you the thing is to like you start this giant circle and then you're like hey like person on the other side of the circle you're like well i'll just get up and move and so there is even though there's this kind of staticness it's like interesting and different than walking down the street mm -hmm. because you like put your blanket out and then you're like static sort of unless you move it and so you kind of like have a place and then people like come to the place you are so there will be plants like i would like to collaborate with this fridays for freedom group and be like yeah it's your job to just like go around and talk to people and tell them about stuff like this space is permeable and you're being, you're actually being invited. And like, if I do create these pamphlets, which is like another headache, but will be an important activator of dialogue, which the pamphlet component was inspired by just walking around town now and like everyone being mostly home and a lot of people having kind of like Black Lives Matter signage. So we'll, I'm trying to create a door to door campaign that's not knock on everyone's door. It's like literally only knock on doors of people who have pre-identified as like theoretically being receptive to this content um, and then encouraging those people to talk to their neighbors. Um, but is this like this document that is kind of like a catalyst for engagement. Um, and so we're, they we're kind of creating, we plan the event at this large park and like are encouraging people to like get food from us and then set up their thing within proximity to someone else's blanket. And then are even, seeding that container with people who are activating dialogue within it. Um, so I'm hoping that there's enough ingredients in this soup that there will just be like, oh, did you mention this? Like, you know, kind of things happening. Yeah. Um, and we'll continue to just like build in more structures that hopefully enhance that as like a naturally occurring thing. 
Well, and I just imagine too, by providing people with oh, oh, oh. Start a conversation with a stranger, it'll just happen. Oh. It'll happen. Like people will be there knowing that the intention is to talk to people you don't know. Which will build a different social environment than what we're accustomed to. Um, I want to call the time at 6.15. Um, Y'all have hung out, which is awesome, <laughs> and listened to our conversation. Um, and uh, at least with Urbano, we'll be having a couple more conversations this summer about social practice in the garden, um, and also looking at some practices that incorporate food. Um, so really excited about what's upcoming, um, and if you, want to get on a newsletter go to covictorygardens.com scroll to the bottom type in your email and i'll keep you up to date um but i feel like we should probably ha sign off um yeah. thank you so much for your time and for joining mm -hmm. us and for your project for your work yeah we really appreciate i just it. want to you. say hello and I'm thank you all for what you're doing thank you thanks for thanks, being Mom. here <laughs> <laughs> I know we have some family members in the room. I was guessing that that Stevenson was maybe related. Yeah. <laughs> Biggest fan. Oh. <laughs> so All right, fun. take care, everybody. I'm signing out. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Bye. Mama. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> And um, as Sheila was saying, all of those things exist. Um, my website is also a, a great resource. A lot of the projects that I'm working on are semi well documented there. Um, and it's funny, people are like, you have a great website. And I just like, it's maybe 20% of my practice. So there's a lot missing. Um, but I also have these, all of the village building convergence events were, are online. If you Google VBC or village building convergence city repair 2020, any number of those kind of terms are findable on YouTube um, and hopefully they get up on my website but um, it is tough I think to find resources about social practice but they exist so if you're interested a great place to start is my website and I'm also at Instagram on Michael Stevenson Jr. and if anyone's super fascinated would be willing to answer some emails so um, and, and if you google my name I have really well dominated that search parameter so um, <laughs> Yeah, look out if you're interested. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. And uh, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you again in the future. And um, Michael and Kirk, I look forward to keeping in touch about what you're up to. Yeah, yeah we'll Same. have to do a debrief later. Okay. Um, well, uh, we're signing off. Thanks again. And uh, we'll talk to you, you in the future. Well. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone.